Hi guys, Tim and Toby here, back with you for another uh, military video. Military video. Um, this one is of the Mark IV NATO steel helmet or turtle helmet. So before I actually talk, we both talk about the steel helmet itself, or we'll just talk about the 1950s, or really starting from 1945. Um, the Second World War, 8th May 1945, had finished in Europe, but it was a little bit more time until the 15th of August when the war against Japan had finished. So really by the 15th of August, or late August, the war in general, the Second World War, had finished. 1945, you get um, you get the Germany being split up into different zones and occupied by different countries. So for example, Hamburg and that area was occupied by Britain, British, the British Army, and Berlin area that area of germany was occupied by the soviet union or russia and so what happened was is the second world war had finished so the british army kind of said to themselves well we'll downsize our troops because really you don't need the masses of amount of troops uh, in the field when there isn't really a big war going on and there of course hadn't been a world war going on and wouldn't be for the last 80 years since then so in the 1950s you get different regiments uh, amalgamating together to form a smaller one regiment. So, for example, the Dorset Regiment and the Devonshire Regiment had been two separate regiments for as long as I can, uh, as I can know, and long as they can know. In 19, about 1951, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, the Dorsets and Devonshire Regiment amalgamated together to form just one regiment to downsize to create the Dorset or Devon and Dorset Regiment have one regiment and for example lots of regiments did that um, you know just to downsize like the Royal Norfolk Regiment and the Suffolk Regiment downsides uh, to create the East Anglian Regiment in 1959 again it's downsizing so the British Army wouldn't have a lot of manpower to downsize you know downsizing the troops basically meaning that they don't need a lot of expenses uh, with you know a war um, Basically, that's what they did in the 1950s, is downsizing. And in doing that, they created the Mark IV uh, NATO helmet, which basically is a copy of the Mark III turtle helmet and the Mark IV turtle helmet, but this is the NATO standard of steel helmet, of turtle helmet. So, Toby, do you want to continue? Yeah, so this is a very, very iconic example of a um, steel helmet. Of course, the design... It dates back to the Mark III, which first appeared on the Normandy beaches. Slightly updated, you know, certain aspects, but same shape, you know. And it's it's always a very iconic design, to me anyway, of the early post-war period. Um, you know, lots of these on national service, because that was still a thing back then. Um, I remember my granddad telling me um, he didn't really wear them very often unless you went out on exercise because they're uncomfortable. Well, to wear for too long, of course. I mean, it's a steel helmet. It's not exactly going to be, you know, like a nice, soft beanie cap. But anyway, um, uh, it's it's um, always really interesting, though, to think where these things actually were. Like, obviously, this one could have just been in Britain, um, for all I know. But, you know, it, it really gets your mind thinking, was it in, you know, Berlin? Was it in, uh, even in the Far East, you know, where we still had an empire? And after the Second World War, that this led to some very interesting smaller conflicts. Like, as our empire gradually began to sort of disband, sort of decay, really, um, we were gradually pulling out, and that led to sort of, you know, events overtaking us sometimes, and we had to, well, yeah, we ended up fighting, but... Um, it's always it's always an interesting thing, as you can see. This one's quite nicely used, but it's not too beat up, so it's a nice condition. Mm -hmm. um, other things about these, so obviously this is the Mark IV NATO. There's also the Mark IV sort of Far East edition, so to say. Um, I also wanted to speak a bit about these, which is in the nineteen I think seventies. There's probably some gurus on. Uh, steel helmets that are probably going to correct me, but oh well. Um, there's there's a lot of these which were converted to what most people call the Mark IV 
no, Mark V. Now, it's not technically the Mark V, it's actually a Mark IV A, or something like that. Um, I think it's a Mark IV A. By basically getting the liner, which you can see in here, and replacing it with, I'm not entirely sure how to describe it, but it's basically a cloth liner, which goes all the way around like that, it's almost... I mean, it almost looks weirdly like a jelly mould or something. I don't know why that comes to mind. And it has a small little red bit of, I think, rubber in the top, and that sometimes has a date on it. They were in use by the Falklands. But um, these, as you can tell, doesn't have that, so it's, it's a 50s one. I think this one's dated 1952 or something like that. But, um, you know, it's amazing to think that these are designed which entered service in 1944, it was still in use until, I don't know the exact latest use, but I'm thinking approximately 1985 maybe at a push. Mm. So, you know, it's a long-serving design and it's a testament, I think, to some of the British kit. I'm not saying all British kit is good. No, no, it's not. But um, it's a testament to the design that something, you know, so old was still in service, you know, 40 years later, and I think, who else used these? I think the Indians had them, if I remember correctly. Um, I think Pakistan probably had a few, a lot of those sort of ex-Commonwealth, no, they're still Commonwealth, ex-Empire countries, so to say, um, had them. Um, I was just going to go into one last sort of forgotten thing of the 50s, if that's okay, which is... Um, other than, you know, all of the conflicts, guarding, that kind of thing that uh, the army had to deal with, there's also a little known thing known as the Christmas Island Test, which took place, which was us testing our nuclear weapons. Now, um, I've known people who were there, and, you know, they'd have been wearing tropical stuff, but also these, these, as I say, they're general issue, they were everywhere. Um, and... I might actually do a separate video on that, but um, basically they ended up becoming unwitting subjects for testing, so to say, and a lot of them um, died as a result of radiation exposure, but yeah, that's a little sort of thing that should really be more known, but isn't. So yeah, I'll hand you back to Tim. Well, thanks, Toby, thanks for that. Um, I'll just go over the quick three difference between, differences between the, the Mark III, the Mark IV, and the Mark IV NATO steel helmet. So when the Mark III turtle helmet was introduced, didn't uh, the Mark III turtle helmet, uh, it didn't officially replace the Mark II steel helmet because they kind of went side by side. Um, but the Mark III turtle helmet, basically virtually the same as a Mark IV Far East turtle helmet, but Mark III, uh, the Mark III liner was uh, fitted in Pardon me, fitted in by a the old-fashioned um, nut and bolt screw. Um, then the Mark IV Far East Mark IV steel helmet, turtle helmet, um, was fitted in by a kind of a push stud, where the user could actually it's basically the exact same on the Mark IV um, steel helmet, the Far East one. It's the exact same as the American lift the dot stud, where you could lift the liner out. And then put it to one side, and then fill that 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 um, your Mark IV helmet with uh, water, you know, from wherever you are serving in, you know, Malaya or the Far East, for example. And then you get in the nineteen fifties the Mark IV NATO steel helmet, which has uh, the same lift the dot feature in the helmet, um, but it's much smoother design, as I say. It's downsizing on the army and the equipment, so it's a lot less, um, a lot, it's a lot nicer, a lot less rugged, you know, under war conditions, if there was, of course, a war going on. Um, what else? No, I mean, as I say, quickly, the Mark III turtle helmet um, was going to replace the Mark II steel helmet, but didn't, um, and is actually a better design as a mark, uh, as a mark of helmet. Uh, which Toby's going to um, speak about in a sec. Yeah, thanks for that. So the the overall design, it's it's just better in general. It drew upon a lot of experience. Um, 
the, the original suit ball design already was sort of, even in the first World War, dare I say it, was already beginning to show sort of cracks in the, uh, the efficiency of it, so to say. It didn't protect quite as well as it, it really should, and um, among other faults, which, again, more people will probably have books and have looked it up, so I'm not going to go into every single fault of every single thing, of every single mark of everything, because... But notable things were... Um, well, let's have a think. Um, it was known to not quite protect the back of the neck very well, which was sort of alleviated in this. It also... Um, well, let's, let's actually just compare it for a second to things like the Stahlhelm, the M1, you can just tell on the basis of the design, really, just that it doesn't offer quite the same level of protection, or indeed perhaps um, just general ergonomical um, purposes. You know, the M1 you could use as almost a, a shovel if you really needed to. Um, but these were a big step up, and as I say, it served for so long you can tell it was. Um, often covered in scrim nets, that kind of thing, to sort of give that additional level of uh, camouflage. Um, they were, you know, I'd say they were very good helmets for their day. As Tim said, they were intended to replace the Mark II. That never really materialised until after the war, um, when they eventually did. Um, and you've also got to look at this and think, compare it to, you know, what it was up against elsewhere. You know, the Americans, they were still using their M1, so they were still the same as us, basically. They in the fifties, they were um, they were still using a Second World War design, effectively. Even though, as Tim said, this has changed quite a bit in certain aspects. Um, but the Germans, that's that's the one you should really compare it to, because that's our you know opposing force. That's our opt force, so to say. Um, with their oh, I can't remember its name. It will come back to me at some point after this video, and then I'll kick myself. But the, um, the East German helmets, the Soviet helmets of that era, they're all good comparisons, and you can see this holds up to them, doesn't it? If you look at it, the design, it's, yeah, I think it's a very good counterpart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Toby. Now, um, if Toby doesn't mind, could you just hold up the helmet quickly? Yeah. Uh, kind of... Upside down? No, no, just um, kind of, yeah, like that. So basically, you see that design turtle shaped design if you like if you want to wear one the flange at the back which is on on the right if you look at it here is the back of the helmet um that's what gave it a really good you know sun protection um just any protection really um from the uh, from the elements and also protect the ears more than mm. the mark ii didn't really so um yeah yeah is there anything else before yeah I the that was what i was going to say is some people did grumble a bit that uh it sort of impeded the hearing a little, but mm. I think the advantages very much outweigh the disadvantages on this one. Yeah. yeah. Right, thanks Toby. Um, um, yeah, so I'll see you guys in a, a later stage for another video, and hope you all will. See ya, bye.